For the first program, we would like to invite Professor Stuart Russell to deliver his keynote speech. Professor Russell is a professor of electrical engineering and computer sciences at University of California, Berkeley. He is also a scientist, and his book, very, very famous, Artificial Intelligence, a Modern Approach, is touched as the most famous uh, textbook for AI, used by 1,500 universities across 135 uh, countries. So today, Professor Russell will deliver his keynote speech with the title of Probably Beneficial Artificial Intelligence. So I think that it will be a good opportunity to share new and uh, useful type of AI and at the same time the dangers of AI. So ladies and gentlemen, now please welcome Professor Russell on screen. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I'm sorry I can't be there with you in person. Um, and it really looks like an amazing program. Uh, there are so many wonderful speakers and I'm sure they will tie up many of the loose ends uh, that come from my presentation. Uh, so today I am going to talk about provably beneficial artificial intelligence. To begin, let me just talk about artificial intelligence. What is it? Uh, so we know it's about making uh, intelligent machines. What that means and what it has meant since the beginning of the field uh, is machines that are intelligent to the extent that their actions can be expected to achieve their objectives. Uh, so this really borrows the notion of rationality from economics and philosophy uh, and, and applies it to machines. And this has been a very successful uh, way to think about building AI systems. And there are many different branches of AI that have developed over the last 70 years or so. Um, uh, the earliest ones were problem solving, uh, game playing, constraint satisfaction, which, uh, which searched through very large combinatorial spaces to find uh, solutions to difficult problems. Uh, that was soon joined by methods based on logic and then probability for representing knowledge and doing reasoning. Uh, we then have the application areas like language understanding, speech, vision, robotics, and so on. And underpinning the last decade's progress, uh, we have been using machine learning to actually achieve many of the tasks that I just mentioned, uh, particularly uh, under the heading of deep learning. But all these successes we've had so far have been in fairly narrow areas. And I think it's important to remember that the goal of AI always has been to achieve general purpose AI, meaning systems that are capable of quickly learning uh, to perform well at any task that human beings can do. And I think we heard a quote from Elon Musk uh, at the beginning where he said exactly that. So the question I'm really gonna ask today is what if we succeed in that goal? Now, if all goes well, uh, we could just as a very conservative uh, sort of low hanging fruit, use AI systems and their physical embodiment uh, to produce almost unlimited uh, amounts of goods and services, which could be used to raise the living standards of everyone on earth uh, to a respectable level. I'm not, I'm not talking about uh, enormously rich, but a respectable level that, uh, that people can be very comfortable with. And, uh, that would be about a tenfold increase in the GDP of the world. And if you calculate the net present value, the sort of cash equivalent of this increased income stream, uh, that amounts to $13.5 quadrillion. So that gives you a very uh, conservative estimate of the value of achieving general purpose AI. And that, that kind of number is driving these huge investments uh, that we see happening all over the world. Uh, and to some extent, the competition between nations and giant corporations uh, to be the first to get there. In addition uh, to doing that, which we already know how to do, we're just not very good at doing it, uh, we could have new capabilities that are currently beyond what our civilization can deliver. For example, high quality uh, healthcare for every individual um, with much better monitoring, uh, prediction, diagnosis, and treatment planning. Uh, individualized education that would allow every child to reach their potential uh, and greatly improved 
uh, problem-solving ability in science, which of course would have many other spin-offs. So these are all things that AI could deliver. Now, if we ask Alan Turing, pictured here, who was the founder of computer science in many, many ways, the, uh, the founder of AI with his very famous paper from 1950 on computing machinery and intelligence. Um, he actually gave a speech in 1951 where he answered the question, what if we succeed? And this is what he said. It seems probable that once the machine thinking method had started, it would not take long to outstrip our feeble powers at some stage, therefore, we should have to expect the machines to take control. So he offers no uh, solution to this problem. And uh, in the time since he gave that speech, we've seen a dramatic acceleration in the capabilities of AI systems. Uh, so now we have self-driving cars, which uh, was one of John McCarthy's dreams since the late 1950s. Um, we have machines that can beat uh, the world's best Go players uh, and many in, win in many other games as well. Um, this is some work from my own lab. We've been able to uh, improve the sensitivity of the global nuclear monitoring system that detects nuclear explosions uh, by a factor of almost three, just using large scale uh, probabilistic reasoning systems with the same underlying uh, sensor systems. Uh, and this shows the satellite image of North Korea where um, our system NetVisa very accurately and immediately detected uh, a North Korean nuclear test uh, with an, uh, within an accuracy of about 600 meters for the location. Now, of course, there are things going wrong. Uh, like any powerful technology, it can be misused. Um, and as the vice chairman mentioned, there are problems with uh, racial bias. And um, we are starting to see very effective impersonation of human beings. Uh, and I often ask uh, audiences to pick the real person here in this lineup. Uh, and everyone believes that one of these people is real, but in fact, none of them are real. Um, and in the European Union, uh, this type of impersonation is now uh, going to be banned. Uh, so machines have to declare themselves uh, and cannot impersonate human uh, beings. In disinformation system, possibility of uh, widespread unemployment, the overuse of artificial intelligence, which could result in de I'm very sorry about this. Uh, and enfeeblement of human beings uh, in the long-term future. Uh, there's also... Okay, sorry about that. I there must be some sound embedded that you wasn't aware of. Um, so uh, the threats to employment are widely known. Uh, and if those threats come to pass, we also lose the, the overuse of artificial intelligence, which could result in de dependence. Uh, um, I'm not sure what's going on. Uh, so military drones uh, are also a possible threat uh, to human beings, where we would um, perhaps be inadvertently creating weapons of mass destruction uh, that could be used in very large numbers against human populations. But the, uh, the likely outcome of all these developments in artificial intelligence, not immediately, but uh, eventually, and, and uh, many experts believe uh, certainly it will happen in this century, uh, the likely outcome is we'll have AI systems that make better decisions than human beings in the real world. And that leads us to Turing's question how do we retain power over entities that are more powerful than ourselves and retain power forever? Obviously Turing thinks this is impossible, but uh, I actually believe it may be possible for us to do this, but only if we change the way we think about AI. So we are already seeing some of the problems happening with the way we currently think about AI. And as I mentioned, that means machines that are designed to achieve specific objectives. So for example, with social media algorithms, uh, the maximization of click-through, the probability that the user clicks on the, next, um, uh, on the next news item or the next uh, video, uh, that's what the algorithms are designed to maximize. And um, these algorithms, although they're very, very simple, 
actually have more power over the cognitive intake of the human race than any dictator has ever had in history. Now you might think, well, okay, to maximize the probability of clicking, then what we need to do is um, learn what it is that people are interested in and, and then send them things they're interested in. Uh, so that turns out not to be true. Uh, in fact, the best way to maximize click-through is to modify people to be more predictable because in that way, uh, in the long run, you will have a higher click-through rate uh, than you would by leaving the person unmodified. So this appears to be what the algorithms have learned to do. And uh, it appears that people who are more predictable are more predictable because they are more extreme in their views. Uh, and therefore more willing to consume certain types of content. And as I said, these algorithms are very, very simple. If they were better, more intelligent algorithms, if they actually understood that people exist and have minds uh, and opinions and knowledge, then they would be much, much more effective at manipulating human beings. So we see with this example that when the objective that the algorithm is optimizing is not aligned with human benefit, then the better you build the AI system, the worse the outcome is going to be. The algorithm will make more, more of a mess of the world, uh, and it would also be better at preventing interference with its operations. So I proposed a different way of thinking about AI, which actually gets around this problem. Um, so this is the way we have been thinking about AI, the standard model. I've argued that this is not uh, a feasible solution as AI systems become more and more powerful. Instead, we want a slight change to the model. We want machines that are not intelligent, but beneficial. And they're beneficial to the extent that their actions can be expected to achieve our objectives. That is our true preferences about the future, uh, which we may try to communicate, um, but usually we may not even know or be able to explicate our own true preferences. So this is a more difficult problem for the machines. But in fact, this is what we want. And we can embody that idea in three simple principles. The first principle is that AI systems should satisfy human preferences, what we want the future to be like. Um, and uh, we don't all agree. There are many different uh, human preferences. And of course, uh, the machine will have to understand all those different uh, preferences and uh, have to figure out uh, how to make the appropriate trade-offs. But the important principle here is number two, the idea that we are going to build AI systems that know that they do not know what the objective is. So they are explicitly uncertain about the human preferences that they need to satisfy. Uh, the third principle grounds this notion of preferences in human behavior, uh, because uh, the reason why we behave the way we do is because of the preferences we have about the future. Now, the connection there is a complicated one and sometimes imperfect. So the evidence is not very straightforward to interpret. But when you take those three principles, you can turn them into a mathematical model that we call an assistance game. And you can solve that mathematical model. You can write algorithms uh, that calculate solutions to this formal mathematical problem. And then you can look at the behavior uh, that the algorithms exhibit. Uh, and indeed, they do defer to human beings. If they are about to uh, take some action that changes the world in ways that they are not sure we prefer, then they have an incentive to ask permission before doing that. And in the extreme case, as we'll see, they will allow themselves to be switched off. And we can show that it's rational for us, no matter what our preferences are, it's rational for us to build machines that solve assistance games that learn more about our preferences and behave in this deferential way uh, in order to help us achieve what we want in the future. And you can show also that the better uh, the AI system, the more intelligent it is, the better the outcome will be for human beings in this new model. So let me give you a simple example to make this clear. You are the robot. Your partner is the human being. And the task here is to buy your partner the perfect birthday present. And to make sure that money isn't a factor, we're going to buy it using money from the joint account. So in this case, your payoff is precisely your partner's happiness with the present. 
Okay, and this is, uh, a, I think, a very nice real life example of the situation that the robot finds itself in. And it could use all kinds of strategies uh, to try to solve this problem. Uh, it, could, it could leave pictures of different kinds of objects around the house and see whether your pa the partner says, oh, that looks like a really nice uh, car, or that looks like a, you know, a beautiful vacation or whatever it might be. Um, or you could ask the, their friends, have they dropped any hints about what they would like for their birthday? Uh, and so on. Now, of course, um, this problem actually is known to be unsolvable, but all other instances of assistance games actually do have solutions. And uh, at least in principle, we know how to calculate those solutions. So I mentioned that the AI system will allow us to switch it off. And um, I'm giving you this uh, example. This is the robot in our laboratory, uh, the, the PR2. It's a very big robot. It's about 200 kilograms, and so it can be quite unsafe, and it has an off switch on the back. Now, the off switch problem is basically that machines designed in the standard model of AI um, will actually reason in ways that we do not want them to reason. Uh, so, for example, if we specify as an objective that, that, that they should fetch the coffee, they will reason as follows. I must fetch the coffee. I can't fetch the coffee if I'm dead. Therefore, I must disable my off switch. Now, this is not because we put in self-preservation as a goal. Uh, it's because we put in fetching the coffee as a goal, and you can't fetch the coffee if you're dead. Now, we may get even more extreme behaviors like tasering all the other Starbucks customers, and we don't want machines that behave this way. We do not want them to disable their off switch. We want to be able to switch them off should we so choose. Now with the new model, the, the reasoning goes quite differently. The human might switch me off, but only if I'm doing something wrong. I don't know what wrong is, this is the second principle, but I know that I don't want to do it. And therefore I should let the human switch me off in order to prevent me from doing something that will make the human unhappy. Um, and as with these kinds of informal arguments, if you rewrite them in Greek letters, then they become mathematical arguments. Uh, and then you have a mathematical theorem. Uh, and you can show that the robot designed this way is provably beneficial to humans and provably will allow itself to be switched off. So there are many additional uh, directions for research. And I'm sure many of you are thinking that there are all these open questions, uh, and some of them will be discussed, I think, by speakers later on today. Uh, we have to deal with the fact that there are many humans, so there are trade-offs that have to be made uh, in decisions that machines will make. Uh, we have to make sure that the machines don't interfere with each other. They're all trying to do their best, but sometimes that can lead to uh, un unfortunate interactions. We have to learn the preferences of humans who don't behave uh, in perfectly rational ways. And then we actually have to, in this new model, redevelop all the foundations and the technology of AI systems. So if you're interested in uh, what, I, what I've been saying and would like to know more, uh, there's an informal version in the book on the left, uh, which is published in Korean. Uh, and uh, as uh, was mentioned in the introduction, um, there's a textbook and the newest edition of the textbook includes some of the technical foundations what I've described. So to summarize, I think AI has vast potential to be beneficial to humans. Uh, and because of that potential, it has unstoppable momentum. But if this momentum continues and we develop more and more intelligent systems within the standard model, I believe we are likely to lose more and more control as we are already beginning to do uh, in the area of social media, for example. Uh, and in the new model, I believe instead we can have AI systems that are provably beneficial uh, that remain under human control. Uh, and this is not a matter of uh, ethics. This is not, it doesn't work when ethicists wag their fingers at AI researchers and say bad, bad people. Uh, instead, we have to get AI researchers to understand that this is what we mean by doing good, high quality AI. Um, because good, good high-quality AI is AI that is provably beneficial to humans. Thank you very much. 
Thank you so much. Please give another big round of applause. Thank you very much. Uh, it's very impressive that we need to change our thinking about AI. He, he also suggested a new approach to AI. Thanks to the keynote speech, I think we can make today's discussion more meaningful. Thank you very much.